I guess maybe just a bit of a preface. I have felt for, I think, the entire duration of my ministry that the church has suffered from an inadequate understanding of the doctrine that relates to sanctification. The Shepherds Conference, the Shepherds Conference 2024, Pastor MacArthur opened the conference. The message that he gave, a very, very, very good message. There's a lot of stuff that he talked about, but I just, I mean, he preached for over an hour and without notes. <laughs> for some reason, somebody gets to find out and zoom in uh, uh, on the pulpit over there. There was no notes over there, just him and his Bible. But he just, um, he ended up using uh, different types of scriptures and everything was, uh, you know, just systematic. <laughs> just like, oh man, <laughs> J-Mark. <laughs> All right, so what did he talk about? So the emphasis was in obedience. He says that for 55 years over his ministry that he has noticed one thing that is lacking is sanctification. I guess maybe just a bit of a preface. I have felt for, I think, the entire duration of my ministry that the church has suffered from an inadequate understanding of the doctrine that relates to sanctification. And even in recent years when... We are pretty astute on the doctrine of justification. And we have that down pretty well, as you heard in the beautiful hymn that was sung earlier, His Robes for Mine. We understand that. And there is uniformity on that among those who are faithful to the Word of God. We get that. We, we go back to the, the reformers and we, we hold their flag and and sustain their impact by holding the same convictions that many of them discovered in a time when it was obscured. So I think in general we, we do well with the doctrine of justification. We even do pretty well with the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. That's a, that's a comfortable doctrine for us. We, we want that to be true. But where the church seems to lose its way is in the matter of sanctification. And that is no small issue because the function of the church is to address in the lives of God's people the issue of sanctification. Okay, this, that's what he said. And he emphasized that we know justification is the work that God does. Glorification is the work that God does. We don't contribute anything to justification and glorification. But when it comes to sanctification, we are responsible to, uh, you know, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, right? We, you know, we need to be in a journey of sanctification. And yes, the Holy Spirit does help you in that. But you just don't, you're just not going to be costing and thinking that you're, <laughs> you are in a sanctification uh, mode, so to speak. And he uh, spoke about the issue people want to be at the sinner's prayer. He well, says, well, if you want the sinner's prayer, it's Psalm 51. <laughs> if you order, that's uh, Psalm 51, the sinner's prayer. But I did like how he uh, did drill in the law of God. In order for a believer to be, uh, to be obedient, you need to obey the law of God. And this idea that's pervasive in our culture, uh, the antinomianism in the church, we forget that the law of God is actually important in the life of a believer even today. Obedience prompted by love is the character of the Christian faith and is the reality of sanctification. Now, why, why am I emphasizing this today? Well, because again, I think uh, this is, this is the, the world in which we all live. The work of justification and glorification is all God's work. We, we have the responsibility in the middle for the perfecting of the saints to Christ's likeness. And antinomianism comes in so many forms. 
and it's left such confusion about sanctification. All denying the believer's duty to obey the moral law of God. Let me suggest some that, that, that I noted. First, there is a kind of a Gnostic dualism approach to antinomianism. And that says the salvation of the soul is all that matters. Bodily behavior is irrelevant because your body's not redeemed, so don't worry about it. That has played out in some gross transgressions advocated by pastors. I, I know one myself who suggested that couples who are preparing to get married have sex together because their bodies weren't redeemed anyway. So there is that dualistic antinomianism. And then there's, I guess what you could call God-focused, although it's bad to say it that way, that's what they would say, God-focused antinomianism, which says he just requires love. He just requires love. And so, because he just really requires love, you have to, you have to do some, you know, you have to do some editing of the Bible. Because so much of it is not loving. But since God is concerned only about love, you have to hold back requirements in scriptures because that wouldn't be loving. And then there is spirit-prompted antinomianism, trusting in the Holy Spirit to move inwardly so as to deny any need to be subject or obedient to the moral law of God. You're free from the law. Just let the Holy Spirit do it. And if, if it doesn't happen very well, well, it's probably his fault. And then there's Christ-centered antinomianism. God sees no sin in you anyway because Christ paid for your sin and then he kept the law for you. So since he kept the law for you, you don't have to worry about keeping it for yourself, which you can't do. And then there is cross-centered antinomianism. No need to obey the law. Just flee to the cross and preach the cross to yourself. And then there is grace-centered antinomianism. All sin has been paid for. You're free. Then there is something that I hadn't come across until recently, lesser sins antinomianism. Committing lesser sins keeps you from greater sins by granting your flesh some satisfaction. All those seek to eliminate obedience to the moral law of God and his holy will. And all of it is an attack on God himself. John Murray said, quote, in the denial of the permanent authority and sanctity of the moral law, there is a direct thrust at the very center of our holy faith, for it is a thrust at the veracity and authority of the Lord himself. So he uh, he did talk about there is a lot of um, uh, this the, the knowledge that's out there, right? Dualism, where people just think like you know your body, you can do whatever you want, just care about the spirit. Okay, that's antinomianism. And then the another one he talked about was just God focus. So this is idea of. Um, uh, you know, the command about love, right? Like, you know, because God has commanded you to love. So all you're doing is just love, love, love. Everything else is on the wayside. This is not, that's antinomianism. And then the spirit prompting antinomianism. Everything is just like, okay, <laughs> leave it to the Holy Spirit. Leave it to the Holy Spirit. He says, no, that's antinomianism. And then there's another one, Christ-centered. <laughs> Everything is just, um, because of Christ, uh, you know, because of, because of, because of Christ, that he fulfilled the law, he kept the law, 
we tend to think like, okay, that's fine. That's crisis department. I don't have to do anything. That's antinomianism. And then the cross-centered antinomianism, where everything, oh, the cross, everything happens, the cross. Then grace, right? We That one, the free grace that's out there. That's antinomianism. And then lesser sins antinomianism, thinking like, okay, you know, I used to have, like, for example, this is me adding in, right? You have 100 sins. Oh, now you have 50. Now you have 60. No. All these things, they lead you to be finding yourself that antinomianism. Okay? It was so beautiful. Just like, oh, my goodness. I've never heard it <laughs> said it like that. Okay? <laughs> and, you know, he did emphasize the doctrine uh, people, the church, need to have the, the right understanding of the doctrine of sanctification so the you know his theme was the tri uh, the triumph of obedience if you're obeying christ what are you going to do okay john 14 right you're going to obey his commandments okay and if you love uh god what you're going to do you're going to obey his commandments all this in john 14 he did talk about uh john 14 as well i was just like wow that's actually the, what we are studying right now as well and he also uh, did talk about um, second, uh, second Corinthians 10, 5. That was, you know, the back of the thing that he did talk about. And this is actually one of my favorite phases, right? Like, you know, take every thought captive to obey Christ. Punishing, uh, your, your, punishing you until you're disobedient, punishing your disobedience. And he says, when have you ever heard the church talking about disobedience, right? We talk about discipline, you know, we, know, we don't talk about punishment, right? And he did give, this is uh, the responsibility of the pastors as part of their job. That was uh, just like, okay. <laughs> yes, and he says, um, you know, why you have the Great Commission, the, what's the point what is the emphasis over there you know you're teaching people to obey you're teaching people to be obedient okay and that is the pathway to sanctification if you're defining your relationship to god by your relationship to the law you may well be outside the kingdom of god antinomianism perverts the gospel by making nothing of the divine work of regeneration. It doesn't acknowledge that. Trying to earn salvation by indifference to the law is no different than trying to earn salvation by adherence to the law. The only way you can be certain of your Salvation is to know that you have a relationship not to the law, but to Christ. Antinomians make duty and obedience a sin against grace. What a trap. Other thing that he did talk about, I thought like, okay, so this, emphasis he didn't say anything to me i'm just like okay you know my ears are on the ground i'm like okay you know uh the the debacle whatever the christian national whatever that's going on and he just go emphasis like no you know we believe in the law of god christians need to be obeying the law of god and then he ended up reading um deuteronomy 6 just emphasizing that and psalm 119 he says that okay so the person who wrote psalm 119 do you think that person was a legalist because we tend to think when people want to keep the law, we call them as legalists, right? So, yeah, oh, Pastor John MacArthur just preached. But I thought this one was out to... <laughs> I think this one was for uh, Alistair Begg's situation. He didn't mention anything about that. That's just me adding in my commentary, okay? But it goes on with this. And I do agree with him. He says, if you, whenever you're going to be in the ministry right and you you know you uh you know you you're calling people out you're doing all those things right you just remember what's happening in um second corinthians uh 10 5 right that's paul saying it says like you know you have to be compassionate you have to be you have to show meekness gentleness courageous competent and you have to be obedient because all these things are listed in that chapter 
and I was just like, wow, that is so amazing, you know. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh, but uh, but our weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strong uh, strongholds, and we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So that, you know, uh, he did talk about that just like, yes. So all these things do go together. I thought that was, uh, it was good. It was uh, a message well received. So yes, the Shepherds Conference has kicked in with this powerful message from Pastor John MacArthur. But I'm interested to know what you guys think about this message. That is all that I had for you guys today. Stay tuned. We're going to have more coverage of the Shepherds Conference. I cannot wait for the Q&A. All right, guys. Stay tuned. More coming. Until next time, remember to be in the know. Thank you.